Good morning, everyone. How are you guys? You sound very unsure. Um, are you good? Okay, no problem. No problem. It's okay to be unsure. Don't worry, guys. It doesn't scare me. Um, it is a tremendous joy to be with you this morning and to, to open up God's Word. Um, if you haven't been here in a while or if you're a first-time uh, guest, uh, we have been walking through the book of Psalms. Uh, we've titled this sermon series Mixtape. We've been taking a few of the Psalms, not all of them, but a few of them, and just unpacking them, literally, line by line, uh, seeking to understand uh, what they say about God and what that implication is on our lives. And, uh, and this morning, uh, we're actually wrapping up the sermon series. Can you believe it? Um, I was telling my wife this morning, it's kind of weird. It feels like we've been in the Psalms for a very long time, and yet at the same time to think that like we're wrapping up, I'm like, wait, what? So quickly. Um, but it's been an absolutely incredible uh, journey that God has taken us. And, uh, and my hope is that you've gotten out of it as much as I have. Uh, I have uh, just experienced so much of God's goodness over and over and over and over again. Uh, we started this sermon series by saying that the Psalms just have so much raw emotion. Um, that they, in a sense, are inviting us to be who we are before God. God is not afraid of your raw emotions. He's not afraid of what you are going through. There's no reason to pretend or perform with God, that you can stand before Him and that He will engage you. He will meet you where you are. And I, I've felt that in my own life, um, just even as I've preached, but also as I've sat and listen to some incredible preaching over the weeks as others have opened up the Psalms and, and revealed to us who God is and what that means for us. But uh, today is the last one. Uh, we're wrapping it up. Next week will be a prayer Sunday as we kind of look towards uh, Awaken and as we look towards the month of September. Uh, there's a lot happening in the month of September, and so we'll unpack all of that stuff to you next week, and so don't miss out on that, but some really, really amazing things happening in September, and then we're going to wrap it all up with uh, an incredible human being who's going to come here and preach to us just to celebrate all that God has been doing, and so um, I'd encourage you to come next week as we pray, as we lift up the month of September to the Lord. Uh, we'll look back, we'll look forward, um, and we'll continue to trust Him uh, for all the good things that are at his hand. And so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray, um, and then we're going to jump into our text this morning. If you have a Bible, meet me in Psalm 91. That's where we'll be, Psalm 91. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful uh, that you have been with us every step of the way. That as we've journeyed through the sermon series, God, we uh, have seen your hand. Uh, we have experienced your favor. Uh, that there are so many testimonies uh, that we could pull out uh, as people share about how good you have been and how you have met them where they are. And so, God, I'm asking that you would do that very thing again today, this morning. That as we look at this text, these are, these are old words. They are, they are ancient words, but they are not dead. They are very much alive. And so we pray, holy words long preserved, for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Words of life, words of hope. Give us strength, help us cope. In this world, wherever we roam, ancient words will guide us home. Because this is true, we can sing. Ancient words, ever true. Changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Father, I pray that that would be true of us today, that our hearts would be open to you. That God, as they hear my voice, through their ears, they would hear your voice to their heart. All of us in here are in desperate need of a Savior. His name is Jesus. God, we love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And so we, we close our mixtape sermon series with a powerful and comforting psalm from 
the Bible, Psalm 91. Now, there's a lot of debate about who wrote Psalm 91. Uh, some are of the opinion that King David wrote it, but, but, but I am on the other side. I'm with another group. I believe that this psalm was written by Moses. And the reason that I believe that it was written by Moses is that if, if we track through the psalm and, and really dig deep, we can see a, a lot of Moses' life experiences in the psalm. That, that he points to things that he experienced with God the Father. Psalm 91 also addresses spiritual warfare. It's important for you to know that. It addresses spiritual warfare and, and God's divine protection. This psalm is commonly known as the psalm of protection. So right out the gates, we're told what the psalm is about, what to expect. The psalm stresses the need for us to run to God in times of crisis and to put ourselves in his steadfast protection. That's Psalm 91. In fact, in the first two verses, we, we, we see uh, four names or, or, or four titles given to God. We're told that he's the most high, the, the almighty, the Lord, my God. The most high, Elion, or El Elion, as some of you might know it. Uh, this name is used throughout the Old Testament. It, it expresses the, the absolute sovereignty and majesty of God. El Elyon. We also see the name Shaddai or El Shaddai, which means almighty. See, and here, here's the thing. Most Bible scholars say that, that the, the, the name Shaddai comes from the Hebrew word Shadu, meaning mountain. It's telling us that, 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 that God is solid, that God is firm. Other Bible experts say that the, the name Shaddai comes from the Hebrew word Shad, which means breast. It, it wants us to, to, to have this idea of a, a nursing mother. Why? Because, because El Shaddai is, is not just a God who is all-powerful, but it speaks of a God who has the ability to, to nurture and to satisfy. We see the name Yahweh, which is the name given to Moses when he was meant to go to Pharaoh to tell him to, to let God's people go. Uh, the name originally had no vowels. We added those in later. And so the letters W, oh sorry, Y, H, W-H represent, and we've spoken about this before, they, they in a sense represent the breathing sounds or, or as my distinction in matric English would say, aspirated constants. Hundred percent. Shout out to my mother. Y-H-W-H. When pronounced without vowels, it sounds like breathing. You see, this is important to know because this tells us that the, the first name that you cry out is And that the last name that you cry out is it makes sense that we should praise his name that between these massive moments our birth and our death if it's the first name that we cry out then everything that happens in between we should praise his name and then lastly, we're given the name Elohim. This is the infinite, all-powerful God who shows by his works that he is the world's creator, sustainer, and judge. And so right out the gates, we're given these four names, Elion, Shaddai, Yahweh, and Elohim. In a time of crisis, hear me, that is who you want fighting your battles. That is who you want protecting you and caring for you. That's why Moses starts this way. He says, let me tell you about this God. 
Let me give you his name. Let me tell you what he can do. In fact, friends, throughout this psalm, a comparison is made between God and the most significant threats and fears of not just the ancient world, but even our world today. In verse 3, we see God's unwavering posture against the snares of the adversary. We also see his steadfast position in that reality. In verses 5 and 6, there is a decisive confrontation between God and the forces that bring fear, whether it's the darkness of the night or in the middle of the day. In verse 7, it's God against a 1,000 on your left and 10,000 on your right. And verse 10 is a powerful declaration of God's protection against harm and plagues. In verse 13, God tramples the roaring lion who seeks to devour us and the deceiving serpent, who in Revelation 20 verse 2 tells us that it is Satan, the devil himself. In verses 11 and 12, we see how God breaks through the unseen world to engage us. Dear friends, the point of this psalm is this, that all who live a life of close communion with God are constantly safe under his protection and can therefore live with unwavering security and peace of mind at all times. That's the point. That's the point of Psalm 91. And so it begs the question, do you always live in unwavering security and peace of mind? Are you constantly safe under God's protection? Do you live in close communion with God? These are important questions that we must ask ourselves. Psalm 91 says, the person who chooses God as their shelter will be protected by God from all evil. That's important for me to say this as well. The promise is not the absence of danger, but to have the ability to walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil. Why? Because you are safe in God. And so I ask again, is this you? King David writes in Psalm chapter 4, verse 8, he says this, In peace I will both lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. I, I, I will lie down, because some of us, we can lie down. We can talk about a God where we, you know, I can lie down, but I keep one eye open. And here, David says, no, 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 not only do I lie down, but I sleep. Why? Because, because the Lord is my place of safety. That is Psalm 91, friends. Now, some of you are probably going, wow, we're done, unbelievable. No, no, we're far, we're far from done. We're far, f- far from done. When, when uh, our brother... Um, Edgar was saying, uh, hopefully, that it doesn't go into the afternoon or the evening. Um, I was hurt a little bit. I won't lie. I was just a little bit. I was like, because I thought the direction you were going was like, oh, guys, today is going to be one of those Sundays where we are going into the afternoon and into the night. But that's not the case. Friends, in, in a world of turmoil and uncertainty, in a world of hatred and war, in a, in a world of inequality and poverty, in a world of injustice and corruption, if, if someone offered unwavering security and peace of mind, you, you would think, at least a normal person would go, yes, please. I, I mean, the, the world that we live in sometimes feels like even in times of peace, you know what it is? It, it's just the systems of the world reloading. It's almost like you know, it's like, I don't know how long this is going to last. And so if, if, if safety and, and security and peace of mind was being offered to you, would you not take it? Would you not ask the question, how? 
How? Moses writes Psalm 91 and says, here is how. It reads as follows, verse 1, it says, the, the, the one who lives, other translations say dwells, the, the one who lives under the protection of the Most High dwells in the shadow of the Almighty. I, I will say concerning the Lord, who is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. The, the, the New King James Version says it this way, and I, I like it a little bit better. It says, he who dwells in the secret place, of the Most High. The secret place. Now there's a song that I, I won't sing, but there's a song that I love so, so much that talks about this secret place. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him I will trust. You see, many followers of Jesus Christ need to learn more about the secret place, the holy of holies. And they also need to know what it means to abide under his shadow. You see, to, to be under a shadow implies that there is proximity. It implies that there is proximity. And here we're told that we must Abide, abide, I love this word, abide. When we hear the word abide, we, we should think of, of John 15, where, where Jesus speaks about, about God the Father being the gardener and that he is the vine and we are the branches and we are to abide, we are to remain, we are to be in him. I gave an illustration a couple of years ago um, and uh, my dear friend, uh, uh, Wesley gave it a shout, and so maybe he'll give it a shout again uh, today. Uh, just to help you understand what it means to abide, I think of the preparation of making a great cup of tea. Now, I am not a tea connoisseur. I prefer coffee. Thank you. I was waiting for that one. I was like, what is going on? But I, by God's grace, happen to be in the midst of tea connoisseurs. My mother loves a good cup of tea. My beautiful wife absolutely loves. She'll make two cups of tea and just have them sit there. And I'll be like, so what, who, are you, who are you making for? No, they're both for me. <laughs> Our two daughters love a good cup of tea. And so I've had to learn how to prepare a good cup of tea. See, for me, and this is probably why I don't like tea, is, is before I met my lovely wife, I would make a cup of tea this way. I'd boil the water, I'd put the tea bag inside, I'd pour the hot water in there, I'd take a spoon, and I'd try to get as much flavor as I can, as quickly as I can, and then I'd take it out, because I think it's disgusting when it floats in there. I don't know, but anyway, it doesn't matter. So then I'd take it out, and then I'd pour milk, and then I'd drink it. I feel like it was a good cup of tea until I met my wife, who showed me how to prepare a good cup of tea. And that is you boil the water, and then you take another pot that you put on the stove. This is how we do it, and I do this every morning when I get the kids ready so that they can have a good cup of tea before they go to school. And so uh, we take another kind of teapot, and we put that on the stove, and then uh, once that water has boiled, we then pour the boiled water into this now teapot that's sitting on the stove, and then we put in the tea bags, and then uh, I've now recently learned that we slowly heat it up. You, you, you don't like put it on full blast, uh, and so that it kind of just simmers, and uh, what's happening there is that the, 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 the water is taking on the flavor of the tea bag. What you get is a far richer a more flavorsome cup of tea. That is how you abide. Some of us, we would just want to get in and out. Get, like, what's the word? What's, just get in and out real quick. Sunday gathering, let me just get quickly in. I'm on a, please, quickly. Can we sing that song faster? I need to get in and out. And then you wonder why during the week that you, there is no flavor. There is no aroma of Christ. 
The psalmist here tells us that we are to abide. That we must dwell, dwell, abide, dwell and abide. Charles Spurgeon says this. He says, every child of God looks towards the inner sanctuary and the mercy seat. Yet all do not dwell in the most holy place. They run to it at times and enjoy occasional approaches, but they do not habitually reside in the mysterious presence. We must dwell. We must abide so that we might experience the presence of God. And, and then notice what Moses does here. Listen to the possessive pronouns. My refuge, my fortress, my God, not, not my grandmothers or my churches or my pastors or my favorite Christian influencer on Instagram. No, 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 no. My. If you want to experience the, this divine protection, this, this divine care, then he must be my God. He must be my Savior. There's, there's this thing, there's this thing that we, and, and I kind of understand what people are saying. Is that, you know, we're like, we're, we're going to pray that, uh, that Jesus would be uh, uh, not just the Savior of your life, but the Lord of your life. And, and what it does is that it, it gives this kind of thing that it's like, you know what, when I first started, he was my Savior. And then as I got into this, he then became my Lord. That is not the gospel. When you surrender your life to Jesus, he becomes both your Savior and your Lord. What you're saying is that, man, as I'm working through the sanctification thing, it's like I'm realizing, like, yes, save me, but I was holding on to some things. Even in that time, he was still Lord of your life. My Lord. My God. A, a, a refuge. A refuge is a, is a place people can fall back to in times of hardship or danger. A fortress is, is similar, uh, but the typical fortress is a, a building designed for battle. It provides safety from uh, an attacking enemy and, and gives those inside a means to withstand assault. So he's my refuge and he's my fortress. I like to think of it like this. Refuge is a, is a place of protection and rest. So, so some of us were like, man, I just, I need protection, but you know what? I just, I need a place of rest. I, I, I need the world just to quiet down a little bit. I need the voices just to, 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 to get out of my life. Just a little, I just need a place of rest and protection. And then a fortress is a, is a place of protection with attacking abilities. And so not only do we need a place just to, 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 to rest, but we need a place where we know that, that, that he's going to fight for us. In him, I will trust. In him, I will trust, 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 trust. Uh, to trust is to confide in. To set one's hope and confidence upon to trust is to believe in the reliability, truth, and ability, strength of something. So when it comes to trusting God, that means believing in his reliability, which is his word. It is to believe in his ability and strength, that is his work. And that is to believe in the fact that he keeps his promises. That's his worth. And so we believe in the word, we believe in his work, and we believe in his worth. In him, I will trust. But who, who exactly, we're talking about this divine protection, but, but, but who exactly do, do, do we need protection from? Who, who do you need protection from that you need to trust God? It's an important question. And let me tell you this, whatever you think it is, or whoever you think it is, it's far worse. I need you to know that. It's far worse. Let, let, let me give you a few, 
a few of the things that we need protection from. Number one, it's quite obvious, Satan and the dark demonic forces of his kingdom. Now, now there's some of us who go, but it's 2024. Like, like I'm concerned about the economy. I'm concerned about the political status of where we are. Like, you want to talk about the demonic? If, hear me, if that's you, then you've lost already. You've lost already. In fact, that's, that's, one of, like, that's one of his strategies is to get you to believe that he's not real. And then maybe, yes, maybe for us here in Rooted Fellowship, in our minds we picture, you know, this red individual with horns and a tail and a, like, like, he's not going to come at us like that. Guys, in this room, it's people who know that, like, guys, may have experienced the throwing of bones. That I, like, you just know. You're just like, when it comes like that, you're like, no, thank you, from Satan. Yeah. So he's not going to come at us like that. Yeah. And so you need to be aware. A good friend of mine says this. He says, if you're trying to figure out how Satan's coming for you, think this way. If you wanted to take you out, what would you do? Satan and the dark demonic forces of his kingdom. Ephesians 2 calls him the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. Paul writes in, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, he says this, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Then, then hear this. Like, I've read this, these verses so, so many times. Like, I've, I've, I've read these words so many times, but it was the first time I read them slowly and I realized, wow, there's a lot going on here. Paul lists four things. So he says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Then he says, okay, you ready? But against the principalities, number one. Against powers, number two. Against the rulers of the darkness of this age, number three. Against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We are at war. Why do you need protection? That's why. You need protection from Satan, who's also known as the prince of the power of the air, the ruler of this world, the tempter, the father of lies, the god of this age, our adversary, the great dragon, Revelation tells us. And hear me, hear me, Rooted Fellowship. Satan hates you. He, he will convince you otherwise. He will do everything that he can to put his arm around your shoulder and to tell you, hey, I've got good things for you. But he hates you. He hates you more than you can ever imagine. He wants to see you downtrodden, defeated, dead. He wants to see your head separated from your body, placed on a stick in front of the church. Why? So that he might mock the church and convince others that the blood of Jesus doesn't work. And look, man, I, if you're a Christian, if, you, if you've crossed the line of faith, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, then you need to know this. You can never be possessed by something because you are already possessed by the Spirit. But you can definitely be tempted. And he will do everything in his power. Don't you dare think that because you are a Christian, that now he's like, oh, sorry, I'm just going to have to leave you alone. No, he's going to do everything in his power to lure you, to keep you away from enjoying the promises that are found in Christ. And so we need protection against Satan. Satan. We also need protection. We need refuge, watch this, from ourselves. From that person you look at in the mirror. Because often, like, oh, the things that are happening at work, demonic. In my neighborhood, it's demons. Maybe. But oftentimes, it's the person you're looking at in the mirror. We need refuge from ourselves. 1 John chapter 2 says this, verse 
15 and 17, says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, hear this, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Amen. Right here, we're told about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, the lust of the flesh. This is, this is man, I, I just want to feel what I feel. It's when you convince yourself that your feelings are sovereign, that your feelings are in charge. I mean, we say this often here. F feelings are great. They help us navigate life, but they are poor saviors. Yes. Another way to say it is they, they're great consultants. They're really horrible CEOs. Yeah. And yet so many of us, we, we, we let our feelings decide. Well, it's because I feel this way, and so therefore I am this way. The lust of the eyes. It's, it's like anything that you put your eyes on, you're just like, I just want. All the material things. I just, I just want. And you believe the lie that they will satisfy you. The, the pride of life. This is the, the applause of me. We're very subtle with this one. This is why we, we love to give our titles and our accolades before we give ourselves. Because deep down we know that if they really knew who I was, The, the, there's a phrase that many of us use, even myself, I've used it. Trust your heart. Right? Like, we'll use it. Like, we'll use it. Maybe, maybe you yeah, just tr trust your heart. What's your heart telling you? Trust your heart. Well, let me tell you this. Don't ever trust your heart. Yeah. <laughs> Unless your heart is trusting God. Amen. If your heart is not trusting God, then leave your heart alone. But how can you say this? I didn't say it. Jeremiah did. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says this. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things. And then hear this part. And desperately wicked. What a description. Not just wicked. But it's like, I just, I just, I want to be wicked. I'm so desperate. Like, like that's what your heart is doing right now. I just want to be desperately wicked. It's like a two-year-old. And so you need protection from you. Yeah. Then finally, you need protection from this broken world. Yeah. Yeah. See, when sin entered the world, it's, 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 it's been decaying. Yeah. It's like a, a virus. It's not like, in fact, it was. A virus was set loose, and it's consuming everything that it can get its grubby hands on. Yeah. It's a cancer. Mm. And all cancer wants to do is spread. Mm. Spread and destroy. Spread and destroy. And so we need protection from this broken world. Romans 8 says this, from verse 18. Paul writes, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Creation is waiting on us. For creation was subject to subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subject, subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. The world is groaning. It's, it's just going, this is not how I am meant to be. The cells in your body, like sometimes it's just, it, it's not Satan, it's not your sin, it's just the brokenness of this world that your cells are going, I'm not supposed to function this way, but because of the brokenness of this world, I find myself heading in that direction of sick, sickness and illness. And so we need protection from that as well. And so whether it's the demonic, your sin, or the brokenness of this world, Rooted fellowship, you need protection. Amen. And so the powerful promises of protection we experience in God are therefore then outlined in verses 3 to 16. The, the privileges of those who dwell in the presence of the Almighty are clearly and beautifully displayed in the 
powerful words of Psalm 91. And so we'll walk through it really, really quickly. All right, so listen fast. Let's take a look at some of these promises. For those who dwell and abide. For those who trust. For those who say, my God. Listen to these promises. He himself will rescue you from the bird trap, from the destructive plague. Moses says, God will save you from those who are after you, to hurt you, to trap you, to kill you. This promises protection against all who seek your defeat, including Satan. Yeah. Verse 4, he will cover you with his feathers. He will, you will take refuge under his wings. His faithfulness will be a protective shield. As a mother eagle protects her little ones, God spreads his wings over you. And under them, you are safe. In Psalm 63, David says this. He says, because you are my helper, I will sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. When we are living under his wings, we can and should sing and shout for joy. Sometimes I don't get it. I'm just, I'm just like, like, I'm like is, it, is it because we're not under his wings? Like, what's going on? But when we recognize his protection over us, we sing. Verse 5, you, you will not fear the terror of the night, the arrow that flies by day, the plague, verse 6, that stalks in darkness, or the pestilence. Some translations say the perilous pestilence. Let me use that in a sentence. That ravishes at noon. We're told you God's protection is day and night. God doesn't knock off. God doesn't take a bathroom break. God is not on lunch. Day and night under his shadow. It tells us that the enemy has no chance. Verse 7. I had a really cool 300 uh, thing here that I shared, but we don't, we don't have time. Verse 7. Though a thousand fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, the pestilence will not reach you. Hear, hear me, the, the odds may be against you and everyone might say you will never make it. You might be hearing that right now where you live, where you work, where you play. Like there is no hope for you. But Psalm 91 says that that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the odds say. It doesn't matter what people say. The one who provides care for you doesn't follow the rules of this world. He exists outside of them. He exists above them. So even the odds, even the odds, maybe 10,000 to one, God will still protect you. Verse eight, you, you will only see it with your eyes and witness the punishment of the wicked. The new King James Version says this, the reward of the wicked, that there is a reward for the wicked. The, the justice of God, here's what Moses is telling us, that the justice of God is not directed towards those who abide in him, but towards the wicked. If you are in Christ, the full punishment of God meant for you was poured out on Jesus. But if you are not a Christian, if you have not surrendered your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior, then you, you owe a debt that you cannot pay. And yet you will spend eternity, if you do not surrender your life to him, you will spend eternity trying to pay it back. Let me just tell you, that is not, that's not, that's not nice. It's the best way that I can say it. It's not, you don't want that. The psalmist says that for those who abide in God, you have nothing to fear from the wrath of God. In fact, the, the, the closest that, that you will get to it it's just by looking at it with your eyes. Just like the Israelites witnessed at the Red Sea as Egyptian soldier after Egyptian soldier washed away as the sea closed on them. You'll, you'll see it, but you will not experience it. Verse 9, because you have made the Lord my refuge, the Most High, your dwelling place, no harm will come to you. No plague will come near your tent. Oh, how... How I, I pray, I pray that you would experience Psalm 91 this way. Verse 11, for he 
will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you in all your ways. They will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. This, this is a reminder that God sends his angels to watch over us. That the people of God are never on their own. A little side note here. Satan uses these very verses to try to tempt Jesus in the wilderness. You know, some of you remember that, Matthew 4. Jesus is carried to the top of the temple where Satan questions Jesus. He questions Jesus' trust in the Father. He, he, he's like, hey, if you are the Son of God, and then he says to him, then jump. Then he quotes verse 11 and 12 of Psalm 91, which, which tells us, which tells us that Satan knows the Bible. If you, if you were thinking, you know what? I know John 3.16. Huh? I'm waiting for the pastor to say, John 3.16, and that's me. For God so loved the world. Which is an incredible verse. And that we should know it, but, but, but Satan knows it as well. In fact, Satan knows the word better than us. And so, Honor, what is the difference? Well, the difference is that we believe in the one whom the word speaks of. He does not. And so he, he quotes this to Jesus, trying to tempt him. However, Jesus is not deceived. Instead, he shows his faithful interpretation of the scriptures by quoting what? The scriptures. Which again, is a, is a great tool to have. If you're trying to figure out, like, what does this mean? Before you go to Instagram, check back in the word. The word loves to interpret the word. Loves it. And so that's what Jesus said. He goes, you know what, Satan, calm down. Calm down. I've seen this before. You don't understand what that word means. He reminds Satan how, how much of a loser he is but by saying you never force God's hand. Remember, Satan, you tried. Didn't end well for you. Verse 13. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the young lion and the serpent. Verse 13 is an enthusiastic shout of joy. The way that we should read this is, you will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the young lion and the serpent. It's a shout of victory. The, the shout of joy is a declaration of the Lord's victory over the adversary. But yet, we're, here we're being told that we're the ones that will be doing it. How? Well, it's because Jesus has done it. And because Jesus has done it, then we join him in what he has done. We join him in the victory. The New Testament says that the devil roams around like a lion seeking to devour us. And yet we know that Jesus' death and resurrection shut the mouth of that lion. And so if you are a Christian, then you know that you have the power that is in Christ to look at Satan and to say, shut up. Yeah. Remember, he's the father of lies. He can't wait. He can't wait for you to get out of here and then whisper, 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 whisper. Shut up. In the name of Jesus, shut up. But, but here's the thing. That's, 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 You've got to say more than that. Yeah. See, so many of us will, 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 will cast out. But, but then you need to pray that God would fill in. We'll, we'll dethrone, but then we're saying, God, but would you take the throne? Yes. We'll displace, but then we'll say, no, God, but we need you in this place. Because yes. if you don't do that, I'm telling you, you'll get to Wednesday. You'll feel good here on Sunday. Yo, guys, we cast out demons. <laughs> Fear be gone. But then you didn't fill it with anything. Yeah. And so it's just a matter of time before fear goes, ah, still empty. Let me slide on in, in the DMs. You know DM stands for demonic movement. Did you, did you, did you guys not know? <laughs> I 
hear, hear, hear me, hear me. Satan is often referred to as the serpent. We read serpent here, but he's often referred to as the serpent, lethal and deadly. And yet in Genesis 3.15, God says, I will put hostility between you and the woman. He's talking to the serpent. So, so, so immediately after Adam and Eve sinned and, and our sin has stepped into the world and is causing havoc, God says, no, 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 I've got a plan. I'm, I'm, on, a, I'm on a rescue mission. I've got a plan. And so he says, I, I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike, I prefer the word bruise your head, and you will strike, bruise his heel. He's, he's clearly talking about Jesus. He's saying, like, listen, there's, there's coming one who, look, Satan, you'll get the heel. You'll ankle tap if you're into rugby. You'll ankle tap, but it's that ankle tap that, like, uh, uh, and then they're back on their feet. Try time. So you'll ankle tap Jesus, but he, he will bruise your head. The, the death and resurrection of Jesus bruised the head of Satan. He, he is wandering. Revelation tells us this. He's wandering the earth with a mortal wound to the head, bleeding out. And, and we, we as the church in Christ get to stomp on his head with every step of obedience towards the good shepherd. So every time you take a step of obedience, that's another stomp on Satan's head. And then another step of obedience, another stomp. Like we are stomping the head of Satan every single time. And then one day, Jesus will return and strike the final blow. Sending Satan and his followers to an eternity of punishment. But do you know this? Do you know this? Like sometimes people are like, yo guys, this church, eh? this, I've got friends who say this. This church is, you guys are, yeah, you love the word, huh? You love the word. Uh, line by line. For 45, 50, one hour. Like, come on, man. And I'm like, guys, we don't just love the word, we cherish the word. Uh, too, too many of us, too many of us, we know more about our problems than we do about our solution. When COVID-19 hit, we were there. We knew, we knew where it began, how it spread, who COVID-19 likes, where to stay. If you, like, we, we knew it all. Huh? Even the variants. We're like, ah, we, another one. We found it, and we know exactly where. We know it all. And yet, when it comes to the word of God, we know very little. So do you believe? Let, let, me, let me close. Let me close with this. There's so much more that could be said, but I'm going to call the band up and we're going to respond in song. The last three verses beautifully express God's personal words of promise and blessing to his people. He, he speaks directly to those who have their hearts set on him. These final words are, are, are not spoken by God's people, but, but are directed towards God's people. Verse 14, be, because he has... His heart set on me. It's, God, God's now talking. So, so before Moses was the one talking. Yeah. And, and God hears the heart of Moses and goes, okay. Because he has, set his, because he has his heart set on me. The, the phrase, he has his heart set on me, is captured from the Hebrew verb, hashak. Which is found in other places, uh, to declare the Lord's love for Israel. And so this, the psalmist here does not just know about the Lord intellectually. No, 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 no. But he truly knows the Lord personally. That's what he's saying. Is my, 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 heart, my heart is yours. In the midst of chaos, in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of crisis, my heart is yours. And so because this is the case, here's what the Lord continues to say, says, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls out to me, I will answer him. 
I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and give him honor. I will satisfy him with a long life and show him my salvation. If you will dwell and abide. Friends, this is the gospel. This is the good news. That apart from faith in Jesus Christ, we are without ultimate shelter. This is why the phrase in Christ is so important. Go read Ephesians. In Christ, in Him. When we turn to Christ in faith, we are considered to be in Him. That is to say that all that belongs to Jesus is ours. That's the ultimate promise here. That all that belongs to Jesus is now ours. All the favor he enjoys at the hands of the Father is also ours. His hands, God the Father, his hands got Jesus through the cross. And so the hands of the Father will get you through your crisis. But you must dwell and abide. And so the moment we believe, the moment we trust, the moment we put our faith in, the moment we surrender it all to Jesus, Christ becomes our shelter. Christ becomes our refuge. Christ becomes our fortress. Christ becomes our salvation. And so how do we respond to this? What is our response? It's to say, God, I, I lay it all down. I lay it all down. I, I, I want to, to dwell and to abide. I want to be under your shadow. I want to enter into the Holy of Holies. I want to boldly approach the throne of grace. I want to be in your presence. I want to lower the volume of the world and increase your voice in my life. And so I'm going to pray and ask that you stand. Father God, we are in desperate need of a savior. We don't have to look too far to recognize this, that, that we can turn on the news, we can go online, we can look at what's happening around us. This world is in desperate need of a savior. But for those who are in Christ, we know that that savior has come. Jesus, you came and lived the life we should have lived. You died the death that we deserve, but you did not remain in the tomb. You rose from the grave. And then right now you are seated at the right hand of the Father. You're told that you pray for us by name. You pray for us by circumstance. You know our situation, that nothing has taken you by surprise. us to experience your divine care and divine protection you tell us to take a step of obedience and that step of obedience is to dwell and to abide it is to as you say in John 15 remain remain father we have nowhere else to go and so lead us lead us to you God, I pray for those in here who are wrestling, struggling. They feel that at every corner it's just another attack, a, another challenge, another thing to try to get over. God, I pray by the power of the Spirit that you would meet them where they are, that you would liberate them now in this very moment. That the 
the chains would fall, that the idols would fall, but that God, you would fill that place with every promise that is yes and amen in Christ. I pray for folks who don't know you as Lord and Savior that now in this very moment, hearts would be open. And even though their ears hear my voice, I pray that their hearts would hear yours. And that they would see you for who you are. And then God, I pray for those who've maybe have found themselves wondering, have believed the lie that they can protect themselves, that they can come up with ideas and plans and strategies to protect themselves. God, I pray that they would again fix their eyes on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. God, we love you. We praise you. The one who lives under the protection of the Most High dwells in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say concerning the Lord, who is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. In Jesus' name we pray.